we come to worship, and, and by worship, so much of what I mean is that we come to remind ourselves of who we are and, more importantly, of who God is. We, we remind ourselves of who our God is and how we relate to him because he came to us to, to make a way that we could relate to him. We remind ourselves that, um, that our God became a man. Um, because he saw us drowning in our sin and rebellion and he just loved us too much to stay away. Um, so God became a man. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He, he died as our substitute on the cross and he was raised from the dead, conquering death, paying the penalty for our sin, destroying the power of sin. Uh, we, we gather to celebrate the reality that those of us who have placed our faith in Christ have been reconciled to God, our sins have been forgiven, the Holy Spirit has been placed in our lives to empower us, not just to, not just to sign a doctrinal statement, but, but to be regenerated, to be new, to be different. We come to celebrate the reality that sin will no longer be our master because Christ has broken the power of sin and that we can be new. We, we come to celebrate the reality that, that God has not just saved us, but, but he has adopted us as his sons and daughters. That we have been welcomed into the family of God, that we are brothers and sisters, that we are, uh, <laughs> that we need to learn how to love each other because we are loved by God as a part of his family, and that we celebrate the fact that we are the sort of family who is just continually, always, at every turn, inviting more people into our family. We're not the kids who compete with each other and say, I'm daddy's favorite and daddy doesn't like you as much as he likes me, or goes home in insecurity and asks, does my daddy like me as much as he likes them? No, we are the people who are so convinced of the gracious, overflowing love of our heavenly father that we know that there is room for more people to be loved, and we just delight in the growth of our family. Uh, we are the people who count it a privilege, not just to call on the name of Jesus, but to follow Jesus. We are disciples. We are people who are following Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. We are learners who teach other people everything that we learn about Jesus for the sheer delight of allowing them to share in our joy. That is who we are, and we celebrate the reality. Perhaps the most important thing we celebrate is that, that all of this that I have shared, we have by grace through faith. We have it not because of our own merit or our own goodness, but because of the merit and the goodness of our Savior, because of his finished work on the cross. And those last two realities that I've talked about, that's really where I want to focus in the rest of our morning. I want to talk about grace, and I want to talk about discipleship. I want to talk about the intersection of God's grace in the making of disciples. I want to begin with the text. I'm, I'm preaching on my favorite, favorite scripture this morning. Um, if you've been around, you, you probably know what that is. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, You then, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. The first thing I want to draw out of the text is the reality that this call to make disciples is a call to all Christians. Um, in our culture, we talk about being Christian rather than being disciples, but the Bible does not use the word Christian but three times, and it's not, it's not using it so that we would take it on as the common word that we use. The Bible uses the word disciple. Um, the, the, the Bible uses the language of adoption. We are, these, we are these sons and daughters of God who follow our God around, who follow our big brother Jesus around because we desperately desire to be like him. We are learners, we are followers, we are disciples, and this call, this invitation to be and to make disciples is to all of us. Paul wrote these words to Timothy. Timothy was his protege. Timothy was his disciple. But God the Holy Spirit preserved these words for all of us. 
It is in your Bible not as an example of this is how one pastor talks to another pastor, but this is how followers of God speak to one another. So from the youngest of ages, this was one of the first scriptures that I brought my kids to. And I would, when Luke was a four-year-old, when Luke was maybe three-year-old, and Luke was around that side, was a little bit taller, I would take him on walks, and we would go around the neighborhood, and we would pray, and I would teach him scripture, and I would, I would quote this scripture to him, and I would say, Luke, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. I would say to my daughter, you then, my daughter, you then, Chloe, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust reliable little girls who will also be qualified to teach others. Did I do this? Do I still do this? We do this. This, this is a mantra in our home because this is a call to everyone. This is an invitation to everyone. This is an opportunity for all of us. If you've been around the church very long, you probably know that Jesus has called you to be a disciple and to make disciples. You, you, if you've been around this church for any amount of time at all, you know that a disciple is someone who follows Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. We are learners who teach every, everything that we've learned to others. But how do we do it? And what about those of us who know the call but we completely lack the motivation. We're, we're, we, we get it, but when somebody reminds us of what we're called to, it doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel joyful, it's not inviting or enticing, or it doesn't warm our heart, it's just, ugh. Oh, you got more work for me to do this afternoon. I was already overwhelmed and trying to get rested up on my Sunday, and now I've got, now I've got more work. What about those of us who lack the motivation, and we lack effectiveness, and we lack hope in the process that it would ever be any different. Here's my big idea for this morning. I want us to understand that only the gospel can make us disciple makers. Only the gospel can make us disciple makers. And as the gospel penetrates our hearts, as we rehearse and remember and just drink ever more deeply of the reality of of who we are in Christ by grace through faith, it inevitably makes us disciple makers. It makes us evangelists. The gospel itself will do the work for us. Only in God's grace do we find the joy and the strength to make disciples. Only the gospel can transform us into the kind of men and women who are capable of making disciples, who can answer God's call to do so. Only the gospel can make us disciple makers. This morning, I want to spend most of our time just talking about four ways that that happens, four ways that the gospel changes us. Um, First, I just want to take a couple of minutes to just overview what the process is. Um, What what does it look like to make disciples? How do we flesh that out here in our context? Um, What is a disciple? How do we do it? I've said it a bunch of times already. A disciple is a person who follows Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him. That's the biblical call on all of our lives. A disciple is a learner who teaches others all that he learns about Jesus. If you look at the root of the word disciple, those are, those are the two ideas. We are followers and we are learners. And this is, and this is how we see it play out in scripture. Um, so all of us are always learning. All of us... Um, continually have the opportunity to grow as disciples. And all of us begin at the same point in the spectrum. The point might look differently, but all of us begin fundamentally on the outside of the family of God. So we begin over here, and and it looks different in different contexts. In a city like Ann Arbor, um, some of us begin as atheists, or we begin as agnostic. Um, In a place like Nigeria, where where I spent the month of July, almost nobody begins there. You know, they begin as an animist. They begin with a pagan tribal religion. They begin as a Muslim. They begin with some other belief system. Um, You know, both there or here, some of us begin, as as some of us are today, um, just as people who consider ourselves to be Christians. Um, You know, we go through the motions. We sing the songs in their country. They they might dance a little. In our church, we probably don't dance quite enough. Um, You know, maybe you give a little bit of money, whatever. Um, But fundamentally 
the gospel has not yet transformed your heart. The grace of God has not gripped you in a transforming way. Um, spiritually speaking, you're still on the outside. So what, what does an outsider need? An outsider needs to know the love of God. An outsider needs to know the love of God. They need to know the love of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, they need to know the things that I've already shared, that we've already rehearsed this morning. That God loved us so lavishly, so ridiculously, that God left heaven, that he became a man, that Christ died for our sins, that he rose from the grave, that we might be reconciled to God. They need to know a God of that sort of love in the gospel. But the love of God that they need to know is not just proclamation. It is proclamation of the gospel, but it is not only proclamation of the gospel. They also need to know the love of Christ in us. They need to know it in community. We need to welcome people on the outside in. We need to be lavishly loving people like our God. If we want them to know the love of God, then let's be people who love like God loves. Let's be people who love selflessly. Let's be people who love lavishly. Let's, let's be people who love sacrificially. That's, that's what people need. As, as they experience the love of God, the way we talk about it at Mosaic, they move from an outsider to explorer. They have a bit of connection. They have a bit of understanding. And what do we do then? At that point, we simply pray that God would move. Because they don't just need information. They don't just need community. They don't just need to see love. They need, they need to be moved from death to life. The Bible paints the picture of anyone, all of us is one of two camps. We are we either dead in our sins apart from God or we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Still, still sinful, still wicked in many ways on both sides. But, but that person who is experiencing the love of God needs to be brought from death to life. They need to be regenerated. They need to be raised from the dead. And you and I can't do that. My preaching cannot do that. Your, your track, your, your sharing of the gospel, your love for your neighbor cannot do that. God, the Holy Spirit, must do that. And so we pray that God will move. That, they will bring, that God will bring this person to salvation. And, and then what? And, and then we've only begun the process. Um, then, then, we, then we, okay, we're, we're a follower of God and now we, we need to figure out what that means. We need to learn about our God. We need, to, we need to help this person to learn how to study God's word for themselves, to, um, to know better who God is, to, to know his character, to know his values, to know, to know all about him. We need to help this person who's, um, who's been regenerate, who's chosen to follow God, to understand, well, what does it really look like for a follower of God to relate to the people of God? What does it look like to be a part of his church? What does it look like to be a part of this thing that, that Christ calls his body? What does it look to be a member, not in the sense of membership in the country club, but member of a body? A leg, a limb, an arm, a nose, whatever. And, uh, someone who is knit into the family of God, into the body of Christ. And then from there, we need to help people figure out what does it look like to reproduce other disciples of Jesus Christ. Again, we're, we're not just called to make converts. We're not just called to, to, to get people to sign on the dotted line, walk the aisle, pl- pray the prayer, but to be mature disciple makers. And there's a sense in which all of us are always reproducing. Everyone reproduces after their own kind. You know, he, Bunnies do that. Trees do that. Um, children do that with culture. You know, they, they, they go on social media and they, they like the different thing and other people, oh, oh, I like that too. We, we reproduce after our own kind. But what does it look like to reproduce mature disciples? What does it look like to reproduce other people who are following Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him? That's, that's the process. And what I want us to understand is that the gospel is at the heart of the process. The last thing I want to say before I and move on to all those implications. Just really practically, wherever you are in that process, you have an opportunity to make disciples. Wherever you are in that process, from, from even if you're a, a complete outsider, even if you don't have any idea of what you think about Jesus, what you want to do with Jesus, if all you know is where we're meeting on Sunday morning and you were paying attention to the announcement and you know that we're meeting in a different building next week, if that's all that you know, you can find 100,000 people in this city who don't know that. And you can share that news with them. We see it in scripture. You, you, you open up 
Um, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, you meet this guy named Nathaniel. He's met Jesus. He knows nothing about Jesus. He hopes that maybe Jesus is the Messiah, but he's, he's still trying to figure out all of that stuff. This is a man named Philip. He goes to Nathaniel. He goes to his friend. He says, hey, I met this guy. Pretty amazing. Could be the Messiah. What, what do you think? Whatever. And, and Nathaniel says, you said he's from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's, this is ridiculous. I don't, I, I, I don't think this is your guy. Philip turns to him and says, you know, come and see. Come check this out. I got no answers. I'm not, a, I'm not a polished disciple maker, whatever. I know just a little bit more than you know. I look over my shoulder. I see that you don't know what I know. I reach over my shoulder. I, I grab you by the shirt. And I grab you by the hand. And I just start dragging you along as I'm trying to follow Jesus. Wherever you're at in the process, that's what we're looking to do. It's not that you need to arrive and be perfect so you can do this. Just help somebody to come to the place that you're at. Look for that opportunity. I am begging you to look around this city and find that opportunity. Maybe it's inviting. Maybe it's, maybe it's teaching. Maybe it's, I don't really know how to study the Bible very well, but I'm willing to take initiative to open it. You want to open it with me over lunch? Let's do that. So many ways that we can begin the process. want to encourage you to do that. Um, we, know that we're, we know that we're called to be disciples. We know that we're called to make disciples. How does it work? How does God want to change us into the people who can effectively do this? Big idea, only the gospel can make us disciple makers. I want you to look at this passage again. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Um, Typically, if anyone's going to preach these two verses, they're going to spend all their time on the second half. I want to spend my time on the first half. I want us to ask the question, why is verse 1 here? It says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is the throwaway line that preachers skip because they want to get to the place that they're, that they're excited about, that's just very tangible and action-oriented and whatever. Why is the first verse there? Let me read it one more time, the two together. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. I want to answer the question, why is the gospel essential to our discipleship? Why must we be strong in grace before we're going to make disciples? And I want us to see four gifts that the gospel gives us. I'm going to talk about the gift of joy, the gift of power, the gift of God's grace as a new anchor for identity that allows us to be vulnerable, and how God's grace gives us humble perspective. So joy, power, vulnerability, and humility. Um, I did a long preface before we even got started. I'm going to move fast. If I don't cover everything in my notes, you'll only vaguely know that from the notes in front of you. Um, But we're going to move quick. First gift the gospel gives us is joy. Joy that our sins can be forgiven. Joy that we can be reconciled to God. Joy to have peace in his presence. Joy to be made new. Joy that sin will no longer be our master. I'm guessing every single person in this room, whether you can explain it in these categories or not, you know what it is to be enslaved by sin. You know what it is to be addicted to something. You know what it is to be enslaved to lust and pornography or to greed and to coveting and to, oh, I've got to have more or enslaved to finding your status outside of God or enslaved to bitterness. You know what it is to be a slave to sin. The gospel frees us from the power of sin that we might be made new and there is joy in that freedom from sin. The gospel gives us joy. And, and here's what I want to say. As Christians, we can still fall back into sin And there is nothing that robs our joy more than sin. Guys, we, some of you, maybe you've grown up in churches that are more legalistic, that are more rules oriented, and you you think that the main problem with sin is that you is that you broke a rule and you're in trouble with God. No, the, the main problem with sin is that sin naturally alienates you from God. It drives a wedge between you and God. And then as that wedge is driven, you take your eyes off of Jesus Christ and you begin to look at yourself. And you wallow and you say, oh, God could never love me because I did this. And God would never accept me because I did that. And certainly God doesn't delight in me, so what's even the point? 
My friends, those are not Christian sentiments. That is heresy. Does sin separate us from God? Yes. Does sin drive a wedge between us and God? Yes. But your relationship with God is never grounded in your performance. God does not see you in your sin and said, oh, I couldn't delight in him because he's sinful. God the Father sees you in your sin and he smiles and he says, I do delight in you. Not because of your own merit, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. My friends, when we sin, and we sin, I sin. This is not unique to you. You're not, you're not like the, the guy who's barely made the team and, and don't let anybody know that, that you're sinning, okay? Because we'd kick you off the team. No, we all sin. And when we sin, here's what we do. We do not want you to wallow in your sin. I do not want to wallow in my sin. I do not want to set my eyes on me because there's very little fruit in setting my eyes on me. We want to be a people who set our eyes on Christ. And as we look to Christ, he gives us such compassion and joy that we then go out and we look to the world and we ask, how can I share my joy with them? My friends, when you sin, I want you to look at your sin just long enough to be disgusted. To turn away in repentance and to fix your eyes on the hope that you have in Jesus. Because Christ is where we find our hope. My friends, I can tell you to make disciples. And some of you, even as I've begun this message and I've rehearsed the call that we have on our lives, you have felt this burden. Shannon's telling me to do this again. I can't believe he's talking about this again. This is all he ever talks about because he's a jerk. Okay? Some of you have felt that. You don't need to raise your hand. I know who you are. I don't know who you are. I know you're there, though. You will not be a better disciple maker because I browbeat you with the call of God on your life to make disciples. Imagine you have the worst marriage in the city of Ann Arbor or Ipsy or wherever you live. Oh, but you go to church and they tell you that marriage is a really good thing. Oh, they tell you that marriage is a joyful thing and you, and you have children and you feel this burden of responsibility that you need to tell your kids, marriage is good, marriage is joyful, you should be married, it's great. How effective and compelling are you going to be as an evangelist for the joy of marriage if you wake up every morning saying, God, do I have to do this again? I don't love this person and they don't love me and this is painful and this is horrible. And no. Try as you might. Brow beaten as the pastor can make you. You will not be an effective evangelist for marriage. But now imagine for a minute that you have the best marriage in the city. That you have the best marriage in the state. That you have never met in your entire life another married couple who you even think has a, a shot at being a contender for having a better marriage than the amazing marriage that God has given you. Imagine that you wake up every morning. Oh, I've, I've got this friend who just turned 93. Uh, he's, in, he's in poor health. His name's Joe Pascal. You can pray for him. He's a good man been faithful many, many years. Um, I was over at his house, I don't know, yesterday, the day before, the day before, and um, someone who was attending to him for a minute, so I was talking to his bride in their living room. Chloe and I were there, and I look down, and I see, <laughs> I see this little plaque, this little wood carving, and it says something like, um, well, it's a new day. That means I love you more. <laughs> A gift from a loving husband to his wife. Imagine that's your attitude. You wake up every morning and you're just, man, I, I, I can't believe that I love you more than I loved you. I do, though. I do. It's crazy. Will you need a preacher to stand up in a pulpit on a stage and browbeat you to go share the joy of marriage? No. No. The joy of marriage will overflow. It will ooze out of you. People will be frustrated with how obnoxious you are, telling them about how joyful marriage is and how they just, oh, find the right person and do this. It's going to be great. 
Joy is essential to evangelism. Joy is essential to disciple making. If you have joy, the process will largely take care of itself. And it cannot be done without joy. The gospel gives us joy. You are not going to find it anyplace else but in the lavish love of your Savior. Man, do you want to be an effective disciple maker? Do you want to entrust these things to reliable men and women who will also be qualified to teach others? Then begin with verse 1. Be strong in grace. Be anchored in grace. Fill your mind with the lavish love and grace of God that he might transform you. Believe what Nehemiah told the workers building the wall way back in the Old Testament when he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you sin, run to grace. Throw yourself, turn away from sin. Throw yourself on the lavish grace of God and let him restore your joy. Second gift of the gospel, uh, second gift the gospel gives us is power. Uh, Look at this verse again. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. The mission we've been given is not to fill the seats. The mission we have been given is not to balance the budget. The mission we have been given is not to preach in such a way that people will walk the aisle and pray a prayer and sign a card, and become members of our church. The mission that we've been given is to make disciples. The mission that we have been given is not to find people who already like Jesus and already self-identify as as Christians and help them to go just a little bit further in the process and be marginally better Christians. That's a part of it. But the mission that we have been given is to go to people who are dead in their sins. Um, people, people who hate Jesus. I mean, in, in Kano, where I got to preach a few weeks ago, the mission that God has given them in a city that is 96% Muslim is to take the gospel to, to the very people group, and not all of them are terrorists or anything like that, but to the people who they fear. Because these people are burning down their churches. These people are burning down their houses. It's to take the gospel to those who hate Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit see these people raised from death to life. For us, it's to go to the atheists, the agnostic, the the people who are dead in their transgressions and sin and see them by the power of the Holy Spirit raised to life. That is the work. My friends, we talked about it last week. You are inadequate for that task. You do not have that ability. I don't care how charming you are. I don't care how manipulative you are. Even if you get them to pray the prayer, you did not raise them to life. You cannot do that. You need power. And and understand that the goal is not simply to take this person who is far from God and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ, see them raised from the dead and into life. The pattern that we see in this passage is, It cascades to the fourth generation. We've got Paul who is teaching Timothy, who is entrusting these things to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So we don't even have a disciple in the biblical sense of a disciple until we have seen that disciple reproduce into the third and fourth generation. That is the pattern. My friends, you are inadequate for that pattern. You can't even start the chain by raising that first person from the dead, much less... Equip, train, and empower that person to become someone else who is going to continue to raise the dead to the third and fourth generation. My friends, we are woefully inadequate to the task and we we do ourselves a disservice when we lie to ourselves and believe that, man, if I'm just a little bit more clever, if if we get a better marketing scheme, if whatever that we're going to transform this world and we're going to transform people's hearts. God has to do that work. And in the gospel, we have power. The gospel is the power of God. Romans 1. I could belabor the point, but unless we are strong in grace, unless we are strong in power, 
Nothing's going to happen. If we are strong in the gospel, if we believe that God the Holy Spirit can use the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform people and we step out in that faith and that power, people may actually be transformed. Scripture speaks of, of the gospel as this seed that falls to the ground and dies. And when it falls to the ground and dies, it produces a harvest 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. You and I can't do that. We need power, but God has made that power available to us. The gospel gives us joy. The gospel gives us power. The third gift the gospel gives us is a new anchor for our identity, which leads to vulnerability. Every single one of us is naturally guarded. Every single one of us wants to preserve our own safety. We want to guard our reputation. We want people to think that we have it together just a little bit or maybe we want people to think that we have it together radically, enormously more than we actually do. Amen? Is anyone else like that? Anybody at all? That is not conducive to disciple making. Some of you, you're, you've, you've begun this process of disciple making. You're, you're trying to teach others. Um, you're, you're leading a group. You're, you're, you're doing something one-on-one. You're, you're trying to invest spiritually in other people. You're trying to share the gospel with people who are lost but you are guarded. You, you don't want them to know the real you because the real you is sinful. The real you is wicked. The real you probably has doubts even about the gospel that you're sharing. The real you struggles woefully. And you rationalize in your mind that if this person knew the real me, then they wouldn't think that what I've got is all that attractive because, man, it's, it doesn't even work every day for me, so why am I... Why am I sharing it with them? So what am I going to do? Well, well I'm going to put on a facade. I'm going to pretend. I'm going to, I'm going to keep them at arm's length. I'm, I'm going to do what the pastor does. I'm going, to, I'm going to climb up on stage, and I'm going, to, I'm going to have a rehearsed message, and I'm going to script exactly what I want to say, and, and I'm, going to, I'm going to make them see this impression of me, and then I'm going to withdraw, and I'm going to go home, and I'm never going to let people get close enough that they actually see the brokenness in my own life. What... How does that affect the disciple-making process? What if you are the disciple of that seemingly perfect disciple-maker? You, you look at your mentor, you look at, at the person who you're trying to follow as they follow Jesus, and, and you see this facade of sinless perfection. And you go home and you wallow in your sin. You know, because you know that you're broken, you know that you have doubts, you know that you have temptations, you know that you struggle, but you look at their life and, best as you can tell, they don't struggle. And you look at the other people around them in the church, well, they don't really struggle either. You are going to be desperately demoralized. You are going to give up, you are going to quit. Because you are going to believe that you're the only person in the room who's struggling. We will never make disciples that way. And we will never become the people who can be vulnerable enough to let go of our facade until we find a new identity in the gospel. Fundamentally, we are people who are continually tempted to live for the approval of men. We care more about what each other think of us than we care about what the God of the universe thinks of us. And so we pretend, so we act, so we, we're not vulnerable with our sin. Men and women, if you are trying to make disciples and you find yourself struggling in sin, men, if you are trying to make disciples and you find yourself struggling with lust, what do you do with that? You go to the men who you are discipling, you go to the men who are discipling you, you go to the men who are side by side, and you share your sin. You make it public, you get it out there, you ask them to pray, you break the power that sin has in its secrecy, You encourage them to know that you're messed up too. And and you bond together in in pointing each other to Jesus. We need that. We have to have this. Men, women, everything, we have to have this. But we will not have this if we care more about the approval of men than the approval of God. But if if we find our identity in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the lavish love of God, in the fact that even though I'm sinful, even though I'm wretched, even though I'm wicked, he has declared me righteous and he is powerful and he is strong and he is able to actually finish the work in me. And it's going to take some time because I'm just that jacked up. But he's promised he's going to finish the work and he is going to love me and look at me and see the righteousness of Christ even 
for the rest of my life on earth while I'm in process. If the anchor of my identity is there, then I can let you see the real me. I can let you see all of it. And will I lose credibility in some of your eyes? Absolutely. Will some people leave the church? Probably. Who cares? We're trying to make disciples. And that means we have to be real with each other. We have to be vulnerable with each other. We have to be honest. Biblical discipleship, it's intimate, it's vulnerable, it's life on life. The other scripture that I always began with with my kids and we still rehearse, I won't quote all of it, but Deuteronomy 6, you can read 4 through 9, even more of it, verses 6 through 7. Here's the intimacy of sharing the gospel with one another in the context of the family. Moses writes, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. It's the language of intimacy. It's the language of community. It's the language of family. It is life on life with one another. Moses says, impress these things. Paul says, entrust these things. They're both, they're both verbs that you have to do up close. You have to draw near to make a deposit in someone else's life. And to do that, you have to be vulnerable. Here's what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. If we are not strong in the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will not be vulnerable with our lives. It takes strength to be vulnerable. If we are not strong in grace, we will not be vulnerable. Instead, we will share truth at a distance, and then we will withdraw into our fortress where nobody can see what really goes on in our life and in our heart. That is not how Jesus made disciples. When, and Jesus did not have to be vulnerable with sin because he did not sin. But Jesus shared his life and he modeled that for us. And you see Paul, you see others sharing life. Um, when Jesus was making disciples, they, they lived with him, they ate with him, they, um, they slept under the stars together, they, they shared all of life together. So much so that when the apostle John is writing about the gospel, He's trying to explain the gospel to people. He opens up his first letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Here's how he describes the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at. It's the image of, of gazing, staring. Well, that's which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim. Because the gospel was not an abstract message that he heard at a distance. It was something that, that was entrusted, implanted, impressed on his life from very close up. That only happens when we are strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Last gift. The fourth gift the gospel gives us is humble perspective. In the gospel, we see that we are weak and that God is strong. That we are wicked and God is righteous. In the gospel, we see that we are tiny specks of dust blown by the wind. And yet God has loved us more than he loves all the rest of his creation. More than he loves the stars in the sky. More than he loves all the animals in Africa. In the gospel, we, we, we get humble perspective to realize how insignificant we are and yet how lavishly we are loved in spite of it. That changes how we make disciples. Every single one of us, we have this temptation to make ourselves great in our own eyes and in the eyes of everyone else. We want to build our resume. We want to build our reputation. We want to build our significance. We want to leave a legacy. We want to, you know, whatever. And it plays out different ways in different culture. You know, how we use power, how we use education, how we use whatever. But all of us, we are, we are desperate to be significant and we are desperate to build our own significance. 
in the gospel, I find an anchor for my significance where I can, where I can get perspective and realize God is significant and I am insignificant. My life is insignificant. And yet God has declared my life valuable because he has loved me. How does that our defect affect our disciple making? How does that affect our mission? I shared, probably shared some of this last week with you guys, just what I experienced in Nigeria, um, the missionary movement that they started. It's 124 years old. And it was begun by three guys who they set off into Africa. It was originally called Sudan Interior Mission. That was kind of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa was called the Sudan at that point, not just the little corner of a country on one side. And, and what their mission was, they wanted to take the gospel to the interior. The gospel had already hit the coasts of Africa, but it had not made it very far inland. And they went to all these different missions agencies and said, we want to reach the Sudan. We want to reach the interior. We want to go 800 miles inland to places like Kano. And all the missions agency told them, love your enthusiasm, but that's stupid. You will die. You won't make it there. It's a fool's errand. It is hopeless. Do not do it. But they had the same attitude of Paul that said, I count my life as worth nothing to me if only I may complete the task of testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the, the guy, I, I shared it last week, I don't have the exact quote in front of me right now, but, but he, talked about, he talked about the opportunity that they had there. He talked about this reality that at the time there were six million people that they were trying to get the gospel to who were di dying in their sins apart from Christ. He said, if we are successful, it means nothing less than opening up the, the interior of Africa to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we fail, it means nothing more than the death of, of two or three delusional fanatics. Worst thing that can happen here is that the three of us die. Who cares? Because we're talking about the opportunity to get the gospel to six million people. We've done the math and the math is good and we're going to go. <laughs> and two out of the three died in the first year. But the one persevered, and he recruited more missionaries, and it became, it became a mantra in the early days of their mission to just acknowledge the fact, I don't know if this was their vision casting tool or if it was the cynics among them, that would say, you will not see the Sudan. That was what they called the interior of Africa. You're not going to make it you know, 800 miles into Africa. You will not see the Sudan. Your children will not see the Sudan. Your grandchildren may see the Sudan and they may see the gospel take root in the Sudan, but you're not. It's not going to happen for you. But these people had hearts that were so transformed by the gospel that they could recognize, yeah, that's all right. Because my life is pretty insignificant. My death is insignificant. My, my accomplishments are insignificant. The glory of my God is significant. It's worthy of giving my life to. That's what I want here. I want us to be disciple makers. I want us to be people who are more concerned with, with gospel impact than we are with our own significance and success. And I want us to be people who are more concerned with the effectiveness of the people we're discipling than we are with our own effectiveness. One of the things that I saw in, in that culture was, was a, pride, uh, a pride in leadership that really bothered me, uh, an exalting of leadership. And man, we see it in our culture as well. But I was thinking, how do I communicate visually to this culture? Because I'm, I'm, I was preaching cross-culturally and I wanted to hit on this issue. So I told him, here's what a disciple maker does. And I got no stage here, so I won't do it. I said, a disciple maker gets down on their knees. And I got down on my knees and I said, a disciple maker drops down on their hands and their knees and they invite other people to stand on their shoulders in hopes that they might be more effective, in hopes that they might take the gospel further, in hopes that they might be fruitful, recognizing they might be recognized for it, but saying, here's the deal. My God does not share his glory with anyone. So I'm not trying to exalt myself in the process. I'm just trying to let somebody else go further faster. Here's... here's what I wrote down, what I've been praying and thinking about is just the prayer of a disciple maker. The prayer of a disciple maker must always be, God, please send me faithful, reliable men and women who will be smarter than me 
and stronger than me and more effective than me and more successful than me so that I might play the smallest role in seeing your glory spread to the ends of the earth. The gospel gives us the gift of seeing, of just humble perspective, of seeing our own insignificance. That my accomplishments, my reputation, my resume, my life are like dust. They're, they're passing quickly. Um, and yet, I've been loved. And so I'm going to put my identity there. I'm going to find my joy there. And it's going to free me to love and to share that joy with others. Amen?